Rebecca, my mother-in-law's voice grated against my patience like nails on a chalkboard. You're still as inconsiderate and useless as ever. This trip was something my son and I were eagerly anticipating. You who had no hand in planning it can make yourself scarce right now. With my husband's departure from the table, the barrage of criticism began. We were embarking on an overseas adventure that Jack had tasked me with organizing. Her relentless reproach left me little choice but to retreat. What unfolded between them afterwards ceased to concern me. My name is Becca, a married woman navigating the waters of corporate life within a multinational entity. Thanks to the flexibility of my job, I've largely operated from home since tying the knot, affording me ample time within our household. My husband, Jack, embodies the archetype of self-importance, always striving to maintain appearances. He's a lavish spender, contributing not to our domestic finances. Initially imperceptible during courtship, his true colors gradually surfaced post-marriage. His mother revels in extolling her son's virtues. While maternal adoration is commonplace, her brand borders on the fanatical. I anticipated some level of maternal bias and was prepared to endure it, but her unyielding demeanor and disregard for dissenting views, even from her husband, are remarkable. She harbors a palpable disdain for me, punctuating every encounter with cutting remarks. She takes particular umbrage with my reliance on my husband's earnings. You're young, get a real job, she chides incessantly. Despite clarifying my professional commitment post-marriage and the nature of my remote work, she dismisses it as inconsequential. To her, working from home equates to idleness, presuming I fritter away time gaming. Apparently, I'm a negligent wife, relegated to the realm of virtual distractions despite my domestic station. My husband, ostensibly, comprehends my work habits, yet he's never bothered to elucidate them to his mother, even when the topic arises in his presence. He opts for willful ignorance. Despite my entreaties for clarification, he evades responsibility, insisting that women ought to manage such matters independently, leaving me to bear the brunt. He even avowed his reluctance to embroil himself in any potential discord. On one occasion, my insistence for his involvement prompted him to flippantly toss a finalized divorce decree my way. The callous dismissal stone, prompting contemplation of divorce. However, the daunting prospect of divorce dissuaded me. If severing ties proved more arduous than our current predicament, acquiescence seemed the lesser evil. It dawned on me that my husband's allegiance lies squarely with his mother. It's exasperating, but I'm compelled to navigate her presence deftly while sidestepping confrontation. The notion of divorce arose not from newfound affection, but from a desire for change. Yet my husband misconstrued it as unwavering devotion, deterring him from dissolution. His inflated sense of self-importance grows more insufferable by the day. While childish pretensions can be endearing, in an adult, they're simply off-putting. I've grown adept at disregarding his haughty pronouncements and feigning ignorance of his actions. Another motive lingers behind my decision to forego divorce. Due to my husband's profession, we reside a considerable distance from my in-laws, meeting only once or twice a year. Initially, I believed I could endure such sporadic encounters. While the world buzzed with excitement over the prospect of a nine-day hiatus by strategically taking weekdays off, both my husband and I remained immersed in our respective work. American holidays held little significance for me as I tailored my schedule to international demands. For my husband, the notion of nine consecutive days off was more abstract than calendar-bound. Thus, upon returning home from his first day back at work, he proposed an impromptu overseas trip, inspired by his colleagues who had seized the opportunity for a nine-day escapade. His enthusiasm, tinged with a hint of pride, left me bewildered and somewhat exasperated. His childlike impulsivity notwithstanding, I recognized my own yearning for travel, having not embarked on a trip that year. Hence, I tentatively suggested a domestic excursion. My rationale stemmed from my husband's lack of experience with international travel, necessitating the acquisition of a passport. With you by my side, language barriers won't pose a problem. Your linguistic prowess is impressive, he reassured me. 
Having studied abroad and ventured on numerous overseas escapades during my single years, I am fluent in multiple languages, proficient enough to navigate conversations in Spanish and, to a lesser extent, Mandarin. Inspired by my mother's newfound fascination with Korean dramas, I even dabbled in learning Korean alongside her. However, my proficiency remains somewhat shaky due to limited practice. While I may surpass my husband in linguistic ability, obtaining passports is no small feat, even with my language skills. I quietly proceeded with the reservations, as per my husband's instructions, while also taking on the additional task of applying for passports, booking flights, and arranging hotel accommodations. Despite the considerable effort involved, I remained committed to executing my plan flawlessly, patiently fulfilling my husband's every request to craft the perfect itinerary. On the day of our overseas journey, my mother-in-law, blissfully unaware of the behind-the-scenes effort, gleefully remarked, just as I expected from my son, it's a lavish trip abroad. We're flying business class, aren't we? Given my husband's penchant for self-promotion, I could envision him affirming her assumptions, boasting about his role in orchestrating the trip. In reality, however, I bore the brunt of the arrangements while my husband remained inert, leaving everything to me. To compound matters, both of them, with scant airport experience, wandered aimlessly as I navigated the procedures alone. Even as boarding time approached and I frantically searched for them, they showed little concern. Instead, attributing any inconvenience to my supposed desire to abandon them for personal amusement, the airport staff, noticing the chaos, offered to make a public announcement on my behalf, only to be met with blame from my husband and mother-in-law for not keeping them informed of the boarding gate. Despite the commotion, their lack of remorse was palpable as they insinuated that I had intended to leave them behind. Throughout the flight, they maintained relative tranquility, yet each summoning of a flight attendant proved to be both irksome and embarrassing. Several hours later, we finally touched down in our destination country, having completed the requisite immigration formalities and other procedures. Just as I began to relax, however, at last, I looked forward to heading straight to the hotel and indulging in a well-deserved break. However, my husband abruptly turned pale and muttered, I need to use the restroom, before thrusting his luggage into my hands and darting off. Bewildered by his sudden departure, I couldn't fathom why he alone fell ill after we consumed the same meal. It seemed ironic, considering his earlier joviality and fondness for the flight attendant. Perhaps it was a form of divine retribution, I mused, a fitting consequence for his behavior. Becca, you truly are an insensitive daughter-in-law. How much longer do you intend to linger here? My mother-in-law's sharp voice snapped me out of my thoughts. Pardon? This trip was planned by my son for me. It's meant to be a mother-son excursion, sans daughter-in-law. You, a non-working opportunist, have no right to enjoy this trip gratis. It's audacious of you to assume otherwise. Leave now. Are you certain? Honestly, I can't say I'll have much fun with your presence here. I see. That's unfortunate. Very well, I'll depart immediately then. Returning my husband's luggage to my mother-in-law, I kept only my carrying on and turned away from her. As I did so, I caught a glimpse of her stunned expression, a stark contrast to her earlier directive for me to leave. Suppressing a chuckle, I marveled at the irony of her reaction. Meanwhile, my husband's frequent trips to the bathroom kept our paths from crossing. Fortunately, I managed to secure a ticket back to America, boarding a flight bound for home. Initially, I had entertained the idea of finding an opportunity to return solo. Had our relationship been more amicable, I might have welcomed the chance to act as a tour guide. However, with that mother and son do, the prospect only filled me with dread and promised no benefit. I can't help but grin at the thought of my husband and mother-in-law, both limited to English, left to navigate without me. While they could rely on smartphone translation apps, if they put their minds to it, I doubt my husband, with his penchant for boasting, would stoop to such measures. After safely completing a few detours, I made my way directly to the luxurious hotel where my parents awaited. Following Jack's advice to honor my parents, 
I treated them to a lavish trip in upstate New York. They would leisurely traverse the popular scenic road, savoring the breathtaking landscapes and culinary delights along the way. I managed to rendezvous with them ahead of schedule, much to their astonishment. As I briefly outlined the situation, they were taken aback, marveling at my compliance with Jack's unusual request. My phone incessantly buzzed with calls and messages from Jack, all of which I chose to ignore. I powered off my device, immersing myself in the day's pleasures without interruption. Upon returning home after a delightful day with my parents, I received a call from the embassy. According to their account, Jack returned from the restroom to find his mother, my mother-in-law, sitting alone. Shocked by my absence, he grew increasingly agitated. Despite his attempts to reach me, all of his calls went unanswered. Left with no other recourse, he embarked on his own to find the hotel. However disoriented and clueless about his surroundings, he found himself in a state of distress until a compassionate individual intervened with broken English. Believing they knew the way, Jack followed, only to fall victim to a robbery, losing his money, passport, and valuables in the process. My mother-in-law suffered a similar fate, stripped of her jewelry. Eventually, Jack was discovered stranded on the street, bereft and vulnerable, prompting the police to intervene and refer him to the embassy for assistance. It was through this intervention that he managed to reach out to me. The embassy official requested that I retrieve him, citing his inability to access funds due to his stolen wallet containing his bank cards. However, I found myself questioning why I, a virtual stranger was being tasked with this responsibility. I clarified that I was no longer associated with the man in question, having retained the divorce papers he had once flippantly tossed at me. While I had initially chosen to forego divorce proceedings due to the anticipated complications, this latest ordeal had pushed me to my breaking point. With divorce papers completed, I wasted no time heading to the hotel immediately upon landing back in the States. To my astonishment, the divorce proceedings proceeded smoothly without any hitches. I had already secured a new residence, with the lease signed alongside my travel arrangements. The thought of using the furniture once shared with Jack repulsed me, prompting me to opt for all new furnishings in my fresh abode. Consequently, I packed for both my trip and the impending move simultaneously. All that remained were my work essentials and cherished wardrobe items to transport to the new place. I arranged for the remainder of my belongings to be shipped by courier at a specified date and time. With no further inquiries from embassy staff, our conversation concluded. Later, it transpired that my former mother-in-law had implored my ex-father-in-law's assistance, facilitating the return of my ex-husband Jack and ex-mother-in-law to the States. However, Jack, still seething with anger, reached out to me. You abandoned me, divorcing me without my knowledge. He accused, his voice laden with indignation. No, I merely followed your mother's directive to depart. If you have grievances, address them with her. And do consider the business class flight I arranged for your return as my parting gesture, I retorted calmly. I reminded him of his own initiation of the divorce proceedings. Do you think such excuses hold any weight? How much further do you intend to humiliate me? Jack snapped. Humiliate you? Interesting choice of words. I could regale you with a rather compelling anecdote if you're interested, I tease. What is it? He inquired, his curiosity peaked. So did you know you're a regular at an adult entertainment club? Seems you've got quite a thing going with a particular favorite there, huh? Instead of contributing to the household, you're pouring your funds into her, but looks like things got out of hand when her demands skyrocketed, didn't they? I had an investigation agency probe into a debt collection notice addressed to Jack, which had landed at our doorstep. While Jack had always been generous with his spending, his obsessive tendencies were becoming concerning. Interestingly, his favorite entertainer's sentiments revealed a different story. She hoped that by continually asking for more, he would eventually lose interest and stop coming altogether. I wonder how Jack felt upon hearing that. That's quite the embarrassing revelation, wouldn't you agree? Keep causing a scene or contacting me, and I'll have no qualms about airing your dirty laundry to your employer. Understood? For someone like Jack, whose pride was paramount, being spurned by the object of his affection would be an excruciating blow. 
The thought of such a humiliation becoming public would undoubtedly be mortifying. Jack, who had previously been confrontational, simply responded with a weak, understood, before abruptly ending the call. A few days later, my ex-father-in-law reached out to me. He disclosed that he, too, had severed ties with my ex-mother-in-law. While I initially saw no reason for his contact given our severed familial connection, it became apparent that he wished to expose my ex-mother-in-law's true colors, given the shared mistreatment we had endured at her hands. My former father-in-law, growing suspicious of his wife's activities, conducted an investigation during her absence and made a startling discovery. His retirement savings had been drained. The funds, it appeared, had been funneled into beauty treatments and cosmetic procedures. As someone not well-versed in such matters, I remained completely oblivious to these developments. When pressed for a female perspective, I found myself at a loss as I had failed to discern any noticeable changes. Perhaps the infrequency of our interactions, limited to once a year, rendered any alterations more pronounced. Nevertheless, I genuinely had not observed any significant transformations. In a moment of perplexity, I even queried my former father-in-law, are you certain these expenses were for beauty treatments? Despite the substantial investment, there seems to be little discernible change. It appeared that any alterations were subtle, visible only to my former mother-in-law herself. It felt akin to pouring money down the drain. Predictably, my former mother-in-law, left destitute, sought refuge with her son Jack. However, Jack, once the pillar of the family, now finds himself drowning in debt following our divorce. He's even lost his apartment due to unpaid rent. Currently, both he and his mother reside in a dilapidated, drafty apartment. Despite their dire circumstances, his mother shows no inclination to seek employment and adamantly refuses to forego her beauty treatments. As Jack grapples with the daunting task of repaying his debts, the added burden of his mother's beauty expenses takes a toll. I've heard he's working tirelessly just to stay afloat. The pursuit of a grandiose facade, despite a diminishing quality of life, appears to persist unchanged. If they find contentment in their current circumstances, I won't interject. However, rumors have circulated suggesting a decline in the quality of the beauty treatments, resulting in a noticeable deterioration in her appearance. For my part, I value the tranquility of the present moment where I can focus on enhancing my work without external pressures. This situation has prompted me to reconsider the importance of living within one's means.